Welcome to Beer Buzz. I'm Liz. I'm Chris. And today we're drinking with Tom Bly from Widmere. So thanks for coming on the show today, Tom. Um, we wanted to hear about how you got into brewing in the first place. So I think there's three people that are responsible for me even being in the beer industry. And who are they? Um, of the three, it's, it's, and I'm not sure which, it's either uh, Fred Bowman, from uh, the founder, one of the founders of Portland Brewing Company. Uh, it could potentially be Brett Porter, uh, who was the head brewer at the time, and then Alan Kornhauser, who was the master brewer at Portland Brewing. And in all honesty, it was probably a little bit of all of them. But um, I reached out to them, and they told me to come in for an interview. And I met Brett Porter, and then I met Alan Kornhauser, and I was asked some really simple questions. And the first one was, uh, what beer do you enjoy most? And I said, on price or on flavor? And they said, on price. And I said, uh, Paps. And, they, and I said, or Huber, because I had to mention, I mean, I have to remind everyone I was coming from Wisconsin. So Huber was, I think, uh, $6.99 a 24, a 24 pack of returnable bottles. And then he said, okay, well, I'm on flavor. And I said, anything from New Glarus or anything from Bells. And, um, and I said, an occasion, I'll pick up something from Berghoff. And the funny thing and the thing I didn't know is that Alan Kornhauser was the, the Paps brewmaster in China and that he had gotten his start at Berghoff, which was Huber. So I mentioned two breweries that he had some affiliation with, and I think that kind of went a long way, and it just happened to be serendipitous that I picked breweries that, that he had worked for and had affiliation with. So you didn't do your homework, and you had no brewing experience, and you totally charmed your way into a job at Portland Brewing. Is that what you just said? <laughs> basically, basically, you know, and I got in the, I got in the way that nobody gets in anymore. I had no experience, but what I did say is I was willing to work for free, free, as long as it took for me to understand the business and for them to be convinced I might be a viable candidate in the business. So Innovations Brewmaster, that's a pretty amazing title to have. Tell us exactly what you're tasked with. Innovation is, uh, in the title, is probably the coolest job description or title I can think of for myself. And I, I really honestly think I probably have the coolest job in Portland. Um, but innovation at Woodmere is specifically um, a myriad of things. It really is a, it's multiple things. It's coming up with new product development. It's coming up with new flavor attributes and um, um, combinations of flavors that maybe we haven't explored before. Um, but it's also really simple stuff like, and it's not simple, it's really hard. It's coming up with process improvements or maybe um, experimenting with uh, new techniques. Uh, for us, sometimes it's uh, access to new materials. Um, there's a little bit of R&D in everything that we do, and we need to try to fold that into all of our, um, our brews that we make. Um, and I, I describe it in a really cheesy way, but I think it's totally legit. Um, I'm in an, on an endless pursuit to make the perfect pint for myself. So you make uh, 10 barrel batches, and you've made 82 beers so far this year. What happens to these batches of innovative test recipes? Who drinks them? So all those beers make their way eventually into the brew pub. Um, and when they get to the brew pub, 16, usually 16 of the 24 taps will always be something that came out of innovation. Um, and it's a great way to gauge um, consumer engagement. It's a great way for us to actually taste them on a repeat basis so we can actually see if there's genuine drinkability to those beers. Um, sometimes we drink beers and they taste great for the first time out, but then you go back and revisit them and they may not be as great as you remember. And then there is a slight morphology to beer over time. Um, after you first filter a beer, it can be very, very abrasive and rough, but over time it can start to soften up and, and round out a little bit. You might see some morphology that's really meaningful. So it's really nice to kind of taste beer over time. Did you burn? I did, just a little bit, but I didn't, I didn't get the full on. the audible. No. <laughs> that was one thing that I never, never occurred to me when I started doing this show that I would be mic'd right here and I'd be drinking beer continuously for an hour and need to burp. I will tell you I'm a big fan of the burp back as a means of gauging um, sensory evaluation of beer. Really? Like the burp back sometimes tells me a lot about the beer. Like what? What does it tell you? Uh, at the, when I first experienced it, I remember it was uh, Kornhauser's Oast or uh, Highlander Pale Ale and it had a hop oil in it. And so when you actually had the belch back, you had actually had this really nice kind of unctuous hop character, but it was kind of reminiscent of, of the really nice soft notes of hops. So I, I was always really kind of excited when I would taste that on, on the return on the retro nasal. Um, and now it's come to, to happen that like when I'm really enjoying a beer and I do actually eventually 
belch, I'll gauge how good the beer is based on the quality of the belch bag. So if, if it's really, really kind of a pleasant experience, I can kind of add to that, that sensory experience a little bit. It has no bearing in, the, in a real world or evaluation methodologies or sensory evaluation, but for me, it's just one of those kind of quirky idiosyncrasies that I think is kind of cool. I'm not a stalker, Tom, I promise, but I do follow on Instagram, and I see that you do collabs like every week. So do the beers that you collaborate with other breweries with, do those go on tap, and do they have the potential to become high-production Widmere beers? Widmere is really rad in that they do collaborator series, right? So we've worked with the Oregon Brew Crew, and we do three collaborator beers a year. Some of those have you know, gone on, on to become... Um, to become products like uh, Noel Blake's uh, Steel Bridge Porter um, that was scaled up and became a beer. Um, Snowplow started off as a collaborator project and became um, a beloved um, seasonal offering. So there's this spirit of collaboration within the Woodmere DNA that started with Collaborator and OBC, and we still have this outstanding commitment to home brewing and support of home brewing. Um, but it also transcends that into these, these collaborations in industry and outside of industry. I was really fortunate enough to, to work again with Christian Ettinger, who's a really good friend um, and a great colleague. We got to make a beer together, and it was absolutely just 100% fun, and the beer's going to be awesome. But I also have experiences that um, really are learning opportunities. And um, I just worked with Kieran and, and uh, an extension of Kieran at Spring Valley Brewery. It's their innovation arm. They came in and they presented hops to us, uh, Murakami 7, that have never been used in North America before. So when you talk about the education component of collaboration, and that's what it should be at the end of the day, you should get something out of it that helps further and advance your education and, and your experience. I'd never worked with those hops before. I didn't know what I was going to get into. So we were able to talk it out and have a conversation about it, but you never know where it's ultimately going to land. Well, let's find out because I think you brought some today, and we're yeah, very yeah, lucky because... We might be some of the few people who get to try this. Yeah, so, so what is this? What, uh, what are so we looking at? So Murakami 7 is a, um, it's a I'm going to call it a petite IPA. I'm going to catch a ton of crap for that. But um, it, it's a small IPA, essentially a pale ale, but more with more IPA attributes than pale ale. A really naked canvas of malt of two row and a little bit of carapils and some flaked rice. I really wanted the malt just to be a background story and really let the hop shine through. And not knowing how the hops would play out, we used this uh, fractured lupulin powder from Japan. Uh, there's a hop farmer out there that's growing this hop. Uh, Kieran also supported Sriracha Ace. And in that same kind of spirit, they have this hop called Murakami 7. And they have about 1,000, maybe 2,000 pounds of it. And they just want to see if it has any traction and any interest on the West Coast with West Coast brewers. Um, so we put it in IPA because we felt that was a style that was, one, going to showcase it really well, but two, resonate with customers so that we could get feedback. Um, this hop is supposed to be pear-like with some green tea attributes. Um, we had enough to make a pale ale, but not enough to really make an IPA. So in order to amp up some of the hop usage, we partnered and utilized a little bit of El Dorado in there because I thought that the stone fruit would be subtle um, and kind of elegant and be a, a backstory to the Murakami. Um, and that definitely worked out. But the way that this has played out now is it definitely have pear, has pear characteristic, has green tea, has a little bit of apricot and a little bit of, of honeydew melon. So only a 1,000 pounds of this hop made it from Japan to the United States. It came to you? No, there's only a 1,000 pounds in total. Oh, wow. And so 22 pounds made it to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we feel even luckier to drink this, but yeah. I heard a rumor there was some leftovers. Who'd you give it to? There was seven pounds of leftovers. Um, when we initially had saved seven pounds for dry hopping, but when it was going through fermentation and tasting it, I thought that the hop presence was strong enough that I really didn't want to go too overboard and heavy-handed with it. Um, so I backed off the dry hopping, and that left us with seven pounds of the, of the hop. And uh, being who they are, I, I reached out to Ben and to Jacob. We gave the, the seven pounds to Breakside because while I think I did a really great job, I was curious to see what they would do with those hops as well. So, Tom, what can we expect from your innovations lab over the next year? I think you'll expect to see more of the same. We'll just be exploring as many styles as we can and trying to figure out how to expand on that conversation. Um, expect a lot more barrel aging from us. Uh, we kind of took a little hiatus from that, and that's kind of coming back. You'll probably see more kettle sours from us. You'll also start to see a really, really small portfolio of wood sours. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Here's to our art degrees, to pushing creativity and innovating in the beer world. Thank you. Thank you.